tonight on CBC Vancouver News. If there's any chance that you have dash cam footage and you're driving that area, please contact our investigators. The search for a suspect after a six-year-old girl is sexually assaulted in South Vancouver also. She didn't deserve this, but she deserves justice. Recognize these vehicles, a plea for help from the family of a young woman murdered in Surrey and... It's interesting that it's actually come home to roost in my own neighborhood. The curious and a Chinese consular visit, the spectacle at the Vancouver home of Huawei executive Meng Wenzhou. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Vancouver police are asking for your help tonight after a disturbing attack on a young girl. The six-year-old was lured away by a stranger from an elementary school playground and sexually assaulted. As investigators search for the suspect, many parents fear for their safety and for their safety of the children. The CBC's John Hernandez has our top story. At lunchtime, hundreds of students crowd this playground at Sexsmith Elementary School. It's the same playground where a six-year-old girl was playing last week when she was lured away by a stranger and sexually assaulted nearby. Police say the man then walked the child back to the school. The suspect is described as a dark-skinned man, approximately 30 years old, with brown or gray hair, and he was apparently wearing gray sweatpants at the time. Police said it took a while for the family to come forward. They have been investigating ever since. The VPD's sex crime unit is canvassing the neighborhood and an officer has been dispatched to the school. But investigators are still trying to pinpoint exactly when the assault happened. They say getting that type of information from a six-year-old can be challenging and they don't want to overwhelm the victim. Today, the Vancouver School Board alerted parents over email. Many of them immediately rushed to the school to check in on their kids. I stopped at my car at the same time to read, and then I called my wife and asked her, like, you, you can, you can, you, can you go to pick the, the kid up? Like, because I was very concerned, so this is insane, something insane that happened here. To be honest, I was really scared, and then I was trying to explain, so, because uh, and they mentioned also in the email the um, like, uh, days are really quite dark. The news was frightening for many, especially since it happened during school hours. Thao Dang has three kids that attend Sexsmith Elementary. She wonders why no one noticed the young girl was taken. School like this, you know, no camera. We need more supervision, aid, more people to watch. You know, only two, three here, but so many kids, four, five hundred kids. Police say they're working closely with school officials to ensure student safety, but so far, no suspects have been arrested. There is a public appeal for help. They're asking anyone who might have been in this neighborhood during school hours on that day and noticed something suspicious to come forward. Police are particularly interested in dash cam footage. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. New surveillance video has been released in the killing of a 19-year-old Surrey woman a year and a half ago. Kieran Desi's body was found in a burned-out car on a rural road. At the same time, Desi's family is desperate for answers, so they are making an emotional plea. Help us fight for Karen because she's no longer here today to fight for herself. An emotional plea from a family still fighting to get through each day without their beloved daughter and sister. She didn't deserve this, but she deserves justice. No parent or sibling should ever have to deal with this everlasting heartache. Desi's death came six months after receiving a successful kidney transplant, something her sister Anjali says made her cry tears of joy. And it seemed like everything was finally going to be okay. At the time of Desi's death, homicide investigators said she was killed elsewhere and her body was brought here inside a vehicle at 24th Avenue and 188th Street in Surrey. Now police are releasing surveillance video from the area. This one shows a dark gray Audi Q7 and in this one, a dark gray Dodge Ram making a right turn. And if it at all jogs your memory or you know uh, who the occupants were or the, or the owners of these vehicles were, uh, please come forward. Investigators also say there are people who have quote, intimate knowledge about the case. You know what we're talking about, and you have information that could really advance our investigation. And it must weigh heavily on your conscience. Do the right thing today and come forward. 
If you have any information regarding Karen's death, no matter how small or irrelevant you may think it is, I'm pleading to you as someone who has lost their sister and their friend, please come forward. And come forward soon, she says, because already 16 months has been too long to wait without answers for a family who says they will never heal. I need a bath. CBC News, Surrey. And when uh, Desi's killing happened back in uh, August of 2017, mm -hmm. uh, that reminded a lot of people of Maple Battaglia's death. Absolutely. That was kind of the, I guess, what shook up the community quite a bit. Both 19-year-old girls with a lot of promise. Yeah, for certain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another case with big impact. The pair accused of masterminding a B.C. woman's so-called honor killing have lost their last-ditch attempt to avoid extradition to India. Jesse Sadhu's mother and uncle are accused of planning her murder. Malkit Sadhu and Sarjeet Badesha had applied for a stay of the extradition proceedings. They argued there was an abuse of process in a plan to whisk them out of Canada last year. But the court has dismissed their claims. Sadhu's throat was slit and her body dumped in a canal after she and her new husband were attacked by a group of armed men in India. Fire crews and missions say it's unlikely anyone was on board a barge that caught fire at about 3 o'clock this morning. Place broke out in the bunkhouse area of the barge that was anchored on the Fraser River near the Silverdale area. About 20 firefighters from all three of Mission's fire halls were called in along with the Coast Guard. Mission Fire says the barge was slated for demolition. Work crew was there last night and noticed thieves had stolen some copper wire. The barge had been used by a logging company to house its employees. Most of the structure has been gutted by the fire. Canada's foreign affairs minister says she has been in contact with China's ambassador after the bail release of Huawei's chief financial officer. Christian Freeland's focus has gone beyond the extradition matters today because Chinese authorities have taken another Canadian in for questioning. Katie Simpson with the latest on the growing rift. If Canada's troubles with China weren't already enough, the foreign affairs minister is dealing with a new urgent concern. A Canadian in China reached out to the government after being questioned by Chinese authorities and hasn't been heard from since. We are working very hard to ascertain his whereabouts and we have also raised this case with the Chinese authorities. Canadian officials also don't know where Michael Kovrig is. Beijing confirmed by fax that he is being detained, but they won't say where or why. A Chinese spokesman says the NGO Kovrig worked for isn't authorized to operate in China, while a state-run newspaper claims he endangered Chinese national security. This isn't the first time Canadians have faced these kinds of allegations. We're very well. Good, thank you. Kevin Garrett and his wife Julia were living in China and carrying out charity work when they were detained in 2014. There was a really extreme psychological pressure yes. and the flights are on 24-7 and the interrogation is very intense and lasted six hours every day. They're calling on Ottawa to be proactive in resolving this case while urging his family to stay calm. These countries, two countries trying to solve a big thing is going to take some time. And I think just take a just take a big breath and, and be patient. That may be easier said than done for Kovrig's family and friends. But he was very, very dedicated. He was so devoted to his work. Every day he wanted to learn more about China and he was so friendly to anyone he encountered. Security has now been increased at the Canadian embassy and consulates in China, a move that comes as the government acknowledges an anti-Canadian sentiment is developing in Beijing. Canada is demanding officials be given access to Kovrig. They want to see him in person, hear his side of the story, before deciding if they'll formally call for his immediate release. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. While the arrest of Huawei's CFO is having repercussions internationally, the focus here in Vancouver is on one house. It's the one Meng Wanzhou has been ordered to stay in. The CBC's Tina Lovegreen now with more on the spectacle around that home. This Dunbar neighborhood is typically very quiet. Very seldom do we even see an individual, especially on a day like today, which is pretty gloomy. But today, the corner of 48th and Crown turned into a circus. Back. 
Reporters swarmed the Chinese diplomats who came to visit Meng Wanzhou. Meng Huawei's CFO was released on a $10 million bail last night. She left B.C. Supreme Court around 8 p.m. yesterday, nearly five hours after the judge's decision was delivered. Part of her strict bail conditions include living at this house owned by her husband with a curfew of 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. She also gave up her passports and has to wear an electronic monitoring bracelet on her ankle all while living under 24-7 surveillance that she pays for herself. She's doing well, yes. Using her house as a backdrop, journalists from all around the world reported live and waited, cameras in hand, for the perfect shot. And in an odd turn of events, she ordered pizza for the reporters, staking her out. But it wasn't just the media paying attention. Curious residents stopped by for a look, too. Because uh, everybody knows it's news. They came to take a picture of the neighborhood's newest celebrity. Is she in there? Agnes Kinderchuk was one of the many people who came to see what was going on. She says it's a big issue. Uh, well, there's a lot of implications, of course, with regards to uh, foreign policy. Um, competition. The 5G is really interesting, what's happening with that in technology, and certainly with, uh, with just being part of global affairs. It's interesting that it's actually come home to roost in my own neighborhood. While the excitement runs high now, residents hope the interest fizzles out quickly. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. The storm you've probably experienced at oh, yeah. some point or another today is going to ramp up. Johanna Wegstaff is here now. Johanna, how bad are we talking? Well, it is going to get worse than what we've been dealing with today. This is really just the first taste of the second storm to hit us this week. Very similar to what we were dealing with uh, early yesterday and the night before that pounding rain through to uh, Monday morning. We won't have the winds quite as strong as that last storm, but it's going to be a washout of a Tuesday, and we're just seeing those showers pick up uh, here in downtown. Let me take you through the latest radar shot. You can see that the first I wanted to show you the warnings, uh, and then I'll get you to the radar shot. The warnings are in place for Metro Vancouver in the green. That's for totals close to 80 millimeters. Wind warnings also uh, in effect for the coast of the island, Sunshine Coast, all the way up to Haida Gwaii. But for us here in Metro Vancouver, how sound out towards the Fraser Valley, rainfall warnings in place for the second time of the week. Okay, here's that radar uh, shot uh, with a satellite uh, over top. All of the green, that's the rain that's really just filled in in the past couple of hours. And we are going to tap into a bit of an atmospheric river, aka a fire hose that's pointed right at the south coast. And you can see that flow in the clouds. That is all moisture headed our way. It is going to be a washout overnight and washout Thursday. Just a quick peek at the next 24 hours. Temperatures will be fairly steady. It's the rain that will also be steady. Uh, I will find another break. And I think the week ahead will all be about finding those uh, breaks where we can catch a breath between systems. So uh, details on that coming up. Oh, boy. An atmospheric <laughs> river runs through it, to borrow a phrase, exactly. I guess. Exactly. Okay, thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, the United States Congress has made it easier to kill sea lions uh, along the Pacific Northwest. Lawmakers say the move is necessary to protect dwindling salmon stocks, but critics aren't so sure. Today's changes lift some of the restrictions around killing the heavyset mammals, making it easier for people in Washington State, Idaho, Oregon, as well as several Pacific Northwest tribes. Wildlife managers say sea lion populations have grown so much they no longer need protections put in place in the 1970s. Critics, though, say salmon face more pressing threats, including habitat loss and dams. And an important recall to tell you about tonight. Kotex is recalling tampons in Canada and the U.S. The recall affects you by Kotex sleek tampons and regular absorbency. They were distributed between October 17th and October 23rd of this year. The company received reports that the tampons were unraveling or coming apart inside the body, as well as reports of infections. Well, free Wi-Fi is coming to the entire TransLink system, but it might not be soon enough for some people. TransLink announcing a deal with Shaw Communications that will bring connectivity to sea buses, sky trains, and buses. But as exciting as that is, TransLink says the rollout won't begin until 2020. 
the entire system up and running within the next four to five years. It is the first uh, deal of its kind in all of Canada. We're, we're always pleased to be first uh, in projects. We were first with our tap to pay uh, system earlier this year in Canada, and we're first uh, with this kind of free Wi Fi. Customers will be able to access the service for free through Shaw Open Wi Fi. That service is already available at both C bus terminals and on all three C buses. Shaw says all the associated costs will be covered by the communications company. They were tight lipped, however, about just how much of an investment that'll be. Half a million people ride the system every day. BC's Rental Housing Task Force is calling for an end to rent evictions. That's when renters are evicted, the place is renovated, and then rents are raised. Over the last several months, the task force has been looking at ways to fix the residential tenancy system in BC. It has come up with 23 recommendations for government. On the table, strengthening of rent eviction laws and tougher penalties for those who break the law. It's a balanced approach. We've worked hard to meet the needs of landlords and renters so that we can have a fair rental housing situation for everyone in this province, which we haven't had for far too long. The report also recommends eliminating the ability of strata councils to ban rentals in a building, and it outlines protections for landlords against tenants who skip out on rent. And we have a lot more details on the Rental Task Force on our website at cbc.ca slash bc. And a reminder, you can also watch this newscast live without commercials there as well as on YouTube tonight. Now we are normally also streaming on Facebook, but all across the country, CBC has been unfortunately having some issues live streaming. So we will let you know when that service is available to you again, hopefully later this week. As the death toll from the opioid crisis continues to climb, a new report shows the hardest hit communities are not the ones you might think. Up next, we'll show you where the crisis is having the biggest impact. Good evening and thanks for streaming the show tonight on our website and on YouTube. If you have been tuning in regularly, let us know what you think of the commercial feature so far. We're hoping to have our Facebook live stream back up later this week. Yeah, they're trying, they're trying to work on that. Uh, in the meantime, we have a little news for you. From now on, every Wednesday, we're going to be featuring our Johanna Wagstaff as she brings us the biggest stories in the world of science. Tonight, she introduces us to Canada's latest astronaut mm. up in space. Cool. Right now, orbiting above our heads, is a Canadian aboard the International Space Station. David Saint-Jacques is the first Canadian in space since 2013, and he will have a busy six and a half months ahead of him. On top of operating the Canada Arm 2, testing new technologies and general maintenance of the ISS, he will also be conducting experiments, about 228 experiments to be exact. Now, many of these experiments that Saint-Jacques and the other crew will be undertaking have to do with basically using themselves as guinea pigs, experiments that will help us gain a better understanding of what happens to the body under long periods in zero gravity. And it helps that Saint-Jacques is a trained medical doctor, so this is also part of his personal interest. He has stated that this is a passion of his. It's fitting that one of the first experiments to be conducted by the team will be a research project designed by a Canadian university. The team at York University's Center for Vision Science designed an experiment to test human responses to being in space, in particular, the perception of a person's own motion while in microgravity. But because space is limited on the ISS, the team had to design a virtual reality program to simulate the experience of sensation or moving which is called vection. Saint Jacques has already strapped in on the virtual reality set to establish a baseline back on earth and will be following that experiment closely. But it's not just the human body that will be put under the microscope. The over 200 experiments are broken down into different categories. Biology and biotech, earth and space science, educational activities, human research, physical science and technology. All of these different experiments basically testing different processes under zero gravity conditions. That's good stuff. Uh, quite the journey for him, for St. Jacques. Uh, looking forward to what Johanna will bring us in the weeks ahead and in the spirit of themes during 
Tomorrow's live stream break, we're going to be taking a trip through our archives, oh, it, our tape archives. Well, this is Throwback Thursday. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> TBT. Um, that will be coming to our show, so that'll be the weekly feature on Thursday, of course. Stay tuned, and we will be back in just a few minutes. We'll have some more of the day's big stories, uh, and that includes a look at the opioid crisis in Canada and what it means for BC and also small towns in our province. Some of the information, not maybe what people would think it would be. No. We'll be Stay right tuned. Back. I probably have the messiest desk in the entire newsroom. I am from Vancouver, born and raised. I was born and raised on a blueberry farm in Abbotsford. As the public broadcaster, I feel we represent communities and stories and people like no one else does. Vancouver's downtown east side has been called grand, ground zero in Canada's opioid epidemic. But a new report suggests smaller municipalities are among the hardest hit when it comes to opioid hospitalizations. Canadian Institute for Health Information reports in 2017, communities with a population between 50 to 99,000 had the highest rate of hospitalization. That means cities like Prince George and Nanaimo had proportionally higher rates of opioid poisonings than Vancouver, more than double in fact each with a rate of about 57 per 100,000 people. And there have been lots of ideas put forward to try to stem the opioid crisis, but a new approach by medical professionals is actually trying to change attitudes instead. Christine Birak has more. Drug addict, abuser, getting clean. Most people don't think much about what those words mean or imply, but for Amanda Dick, they meant she didn't deserve help. People haven't become any more sympathetic necessarily towards the plight of people with substance use disorders. So it's still very shameful. And I think a lot of people are very hesitant to seek help and treatment because there's this perception that you're a bad person. And that's why those words matter. Dick's fear of becoming an unworthy stereotype prevented her from getting help or even talking about her opioid use with friends, family and co-workers. At that point I was absolutely terrified <laughs> that anyone would ever find out. It's entirely possible that in the future our children or grandchildren are going to look back and you know, be aghast at how we've treated people who use drugs. Despite the fact that addiction is a disease that chemically alters the brain, the word addict is associated with a Latin myth about a slave who is set free but chooses to remain in chains. Other phrases in the English language that we use with the term abuse, child abuse, spousal abuse, animal abuse, elder abuse, in each case the thing in front of the word abuse is who or what is being harmed. But when it comes to drug abuse, who or what is being harmed? Certainly not the drugs. Medical professionals like the doctors and nurses here at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health are leading the way with language that puts people first, dropping words like addict, abuser and clean, and simply treating patients who have a substance use disorder and their test results are positive or negative. But some say changing the larger conversation won't be easy. I've been abstinent from every drug for nearly 31 years. Sandy asked that we not use her last name. Her substance use disorder started when she was just 13. She says people judge one another and themselves. Real change depends on everyone accepting that addiction and relapsing are part of the disease and not a choice. People see it as, what did you do wrong? What have you not done right? Whereas somebody with cancer, we'd put the pink t-shirts back on, we would do the walkathons, we would, you know, um, and, and I find that very demoralizing. I was like just in abject terror. That Dick hopes speaking openly out. will help. So She's finishing up treatments for addiction, addiction and hopes others will walk through that door sooner than she did. Christine Birak, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. The British Prime Minister, Theresa May, has successfully dodged a non-confidence vote within her own party. But as her country continues to push towards Brexit, the battle is far from over. Nala Ayad has more from London. 
In trying to tear itself away from the European Union, Britain has been tearing itself apart. Absorbed for months in a political drama that just won't let up. Preparations for today's episode started early. The Prime Minister vowing to fight the challengers within her own party. I will contest that vote with everything I've got. By stepping up to lead a disunited kingdom, Theresa May took on an enormous job. Improbably, she survived. A disastrous election, awkward negotiations, and now in the final bumpy stages of steering Britain through Brexit, an attempted coup. We will therefore defer the vote. It came together after May blinked earlier this week when it was clear her Brexit plan would be widely rejected in Parliament. 48 MPs submitted letters to oust her. But I felt it was time for a new leader. The challenge unleashed an uproar in Parliament today. Ahead of the confidence vote, as added incentive for those who were hesitating, May vowed to step down before the next election. The parliamentary party does have confidence. Yeah. 200 MPs voted to stand by her. Whilst I'm grateful for that support, a significant number of colleagues did cast a vote against me, and I've listened to what they said. So while the mini civil war is over, the insurgency lives on. The Prime Minister must realise that under all constitutional norms, she ought to go and see the Queen urgently and resign. But with the vote behind her, May goes back to Brexit business, its uncertainty as well as its dangers. Will she now put this deal before Parliament and halt this escalating crisis? With the help of those Tory rebels, her Brexit plan may still be defeated. It may well be that when the vote arrives in the House of Commons, whenever that may be, in whatever form that takes, she may find it increasingly difficult to bring those people on side. So, as the political drama gripping this country shifts away from one cliff's edge, it could well be making its way straight towards another. This day, no doubt, leaves Theresa May weaker and closer to being out that door. The continuing uncertainty will keep her distracted as leader, but it's become a familiar posture. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. An intense manhunt is still on for the gunman who has killed three people and injured 12 others in Strasbourg, France. The shooting happened near the city's Christmas market yesterday. Officials in France are now calling it an act of terrorism, and the streets are filled with hundreds of soldiers and police officers. The country is raising its security threat nationwide to its highest level and beefed up its border security. Police have identified the suspect as a 29-year-old Strasbourg-born man. They describe him as an extremist with a long criminal record. Well, she's out on $10 million bail coming up. What will it take for the United States to extradite the CFO of Chinese telecom giant Huawei?
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. Detectives from the VPD Sex Crimes Unit are looking for any dash cam footage from Wednesday, December 5th, between 8.30 in the morning and 2.30 in the afternoon in the area of Sexsmith School. The search for a suspect after a disturbing attack in South Vancouver. A six-year-old girl lured from a playground and sexually assaulted. Police want to hear from anyone who might have seen something or has dash cam footage. Help us fight for Karen because she's no longer here today to fight for herself. A plea tonight from the family of a young woman murdered in Surrey last year. The body of 19-year-old Kieran Dassey was found inside a burning vehicle. Investigators say these vehicles may have been involved and they're asking for the public's help. It's very important that people know that issues that are even at home do have global impact. Neighbors, the curious and the Chinese consular officials were part of the spectacle at the Vancouver home of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. She was released from custody last night on $10 million bail after a three-day hearing. Meng now faces possible extradition to the U.S. And five guarantors have come forward to act as sureties in the CFO's release. The 46-year-old, who also goes by Kathy or Sabrina Mung, went back to her west side home last night. She's been told to live there and stay inside the home between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. She must also report to a bail supervisor, maintain good behavior, and she cannot leave B.C. And here now to explain some of the issues around extradition is Gary Botting, veteran lawyer specializing in extradition issues. And Gary, we'll disclose off the top that you have been in touch with Ms. Among's lawyers, so we'll, we'll get that uh, sorted off the top. But uh, broadly speaking, uh, she's out on bail. What's it going to take for the United States to uh, formally extradite her? Well, basically, after the provisional warrant is, is uh, passed, then... The United States has to uh, put together a record of the case, which is a, a summary of all of the evidence that they intend to rely on and all the witnesses uh, that they intend to rely on. Then uh, the minister has to look at that and determine whether she is going to issue what's called an authority to proceed. Uh, without that, there are no proceedings in Canada. So sh she has the discretion, she has the sole discretion uh, not to issue that uh, authority to proceed, in which case uh, Ms. Uh, Meng, Meng would be absolutely free. She would be released by the court. Now, a key component of her release, of course, was uh, were these uh, uh, uh In her case, uh, $10 million. Uh, how, how does that all work? What, what is a, a, a surety? Oh, a, a surety is just a, a person that uh, is prepared to put his reputation and financial wherewithal uh, on the line to say that he trusts her and uh, he, he trusts her more to the point not to flee, not to go back to China, not to leave the jurisdiction. I want to talk to you briefly about uh, the, the bail conditions themselves. There was a concern raised about a possible flight risk. How do you, how do you think the judge, uh, I don't want to speak for the judge, but how do you think he arrived uh, at, at finding that balance in this case? Well, there's always a flight risk uh, for anybody that is arrested, mm -hmm. uh, unless he is somehow given uh, he has given assurance that he won't flee. Uh, in this case, uh, he wanted some sort of some sort of guarantee, uh, uh, and that's what the surety is all about. Um, I think that the uh, the judge gave a very well reasoned and well measured. Uh, analysis of, of what, what it re would require to offset the flight of risk by giving a $10 million surety. All right, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Look at that. BC Place all lit up for the holidays. Green and red. Very nice. You're looking at a live shot there. Get ready for the rainstorm to ramp up tonight, though. When, we'll, uh, when will we get our next break? That's coming up in Johanna's full forecast.
Well, a group of hikers descending a volcano in Guatemala got more than they bargained for. They were there when the Fuego volcano erupted, and they captured that moment on camera. The eruption started just seconds before they hit record, and soon they retreated to a safer spot. Good call. Uh, one climber described the moment as the craziest experience of his life. Guatemala's National Disaster Reduction Agency later advised people to stay well away. No wonder. Yeah, back in June, the Fuego volcano, one of the region's most active, killed more than 190 people in a devastating eruption. Wow. That, that footage yes. though, is incredible. I just keep seeing uh, more and more impressive video from that volcano that continues to erupt. I've never mm -hmm. seen one that close, though. I'm glad everyone was okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Hmm. Okay, the time lapse today is pretty impressive. I don't know, though, not if it's dramatic going to be. It's not quite as dramatic. <laughs> okay. And I, it's really good. It's probably too, okay. <laughs> it's, yeah. Check this out, though. I, I, I am not, you know, I didn't build this up too much, but look at that. The fog rolling in from the straight right towards the camera and then clearing for a last glimpse of the blue sky before the overcast clouds roll in. I mean, it's not Fuego Volcano, but that was pretty good for a capture, I'd say. Uh, rainfall warnings now in place after that brief break between systems earlier today we're seeing that rain come down right now outside and it has yet to really ramp up it is going to be one of those nights I'm thinking back to Sunday night where you could hear the rain pounding on the roofs and the windows through the overnight and through much of Thursday as well wind warnings also still in place for the coast oh I meant to show you uh, Coquihalla also under the snowfall warning uh, for overnight tonight into tomorrow and I just took some screenshots of the uh, Coquihalla summit just before we lost the light snow is starting to pile up uh, that's looking north and then here's looking south visibility also uh, starting to drop out there so winter driving conditions if you are headed across the pass hope to merit in particular taking you through the overnight and the yellows once again on my forecast rainfall the heavy rain so that's the overnight hours pausing you at 7 a.m still coming down steadily uh, snow levels also down around a thousand meters to start off the day so things will be falling as snow if you're interested in the snow report Keep your eye on that as I take you through the rest of the day. It does start to lift, so we will actually see some rain for the tops of our locals uh, through the afternoon hours, but then it'll drop again. You'll get that snow uh, on top of the rain layer, but definitely looking at good conditions if you were thinking of taking a Friday off or excited for the weekend. But then look at all of that rain. That's the yellow and the orange, especially for the North Shore. Uh, this is going to continue through most of the day. We should see some lightning, and in fact, Victoria, nice little rain shadow for you. Uh, you should get into some blue skies, clearing from the south to the north through the evening hours tomorrow, but it is a washout of a Thursday. Day. Temperatures steady uh, back up to a nine tomorrow and you can see the warmer temperatures translating to the slightly higher uh, snow levels and that is because this is a bit of an atmospheric river tapping into some subtropical moisture and temperatures and that is what's leading to the deluge this time round. Uh, this is our second Pacific storm this week with couple more to come. Rainfall totals for the south coast, everyone in white, that's over 100 millimeters. A lot of that is falling as snow and will translate roughly to about 100 centimeters for the top of Whistler when all is said and done. For Metro Vancouver, those under the rainfall warning, uh, that's about a 40 to 80 millimeter rain event. We'll also get some good snow for Mount Washington and heavy rain for the coast where we're also under the wind warning. So it is a very messy Thursday out there. Uh, temperatures are pretty steady. And as I take you through the seven day forecast, you can see that they'll remain fairly warm. And that 10 on Friday comes with the tail end of this uh, atmospheric river. Uh, temperatures dropping back down on Saturday and Sunday. And that's when we'll get that snow returning to the local mountains. I was hopeful in that Saturday morning sunshine, but that's the next break or uh, coming up for air I could find. If you have outdoor plans, I would sort of shift, start thinking about shifting them that way. Big umbrellas when we walk to all those holiday parties. Exactly. I mean, you can still oh, go. Yeah. Just wear the full Gore-Tex. I'm a fan of rivers, <laughs> you know. I do like them. They're, you know. I, Is there meandering yeah, and? Uh, not these atmospheric ones. Though. They're very different kind of river. Yep. Just keep coming at us. <laughs> <Me> too. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Joe. Um, okay. A big-hearted dog owner in Newfoundland and Labrador is raising a pup born without the use of its hind legs. She's turning her pet's disability into a learning experience for everyone. We are here hoping to raise awareness for special needs pets and hopefully to get people talking and asking questions so that we can show them that if a pet has any sort of disability or problem, that euthanization is not always the answer and that they can lead a long, happy, fulfilled life. Willow is 
pup of two of my other dogs. And when she was a baby and started walking, we discovered that she wasn't walking great. And eventually over the course of a few weeks, she stopped walking altogether. We had seen several different vets and nobody could quite figure out what was going on until I was able to see my own vet in Bay Roberts. And he did some tests and he figured out that she has a fractured spine, that she was born with a fractured spine. Willow has changed my life in so many ways. Um, because of her care, having to care for her and learning how to care for a special needs dog and seeing the appreciation she has for it has taught me so much more patience and understanding than I ever thought I had. Um, she brings so much positivity to our lives. Yeah. She inspires others. It's been quite amazing. Do you think she's going to turn a few heads today in this parade? I hope so. I'm hoping so. I'm yes. hoping she's going to get people asking questions so that um, we can answer them and hopefully change people's minds. Yeah. And Donald Trump's lawyer is handed prison time. We'll tell you how long Michael Cohen will stay behind bars. Coming up. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Ever wanted to see inside our integrated newsroom? The CBC Vancouver Broadcast Centre is open for tours. Email newsroomtours at cbc.ca to book your free tour. And celebrate the holiday season with CBC with special programming on TV, radio, and online. Check out the schedule at cbc.ca slash holidays. And for more from CBC Vancouver, check us out online. Michael Cohen will be serving a three-year prison sentence for crimes he committed during his time as U.S. President Donald Trump's lawyer. Today, Cohen learned his fate in a New York courtroom. The CBC's Stephen D'Souza was there. Before the judge handed down his sentence today, Michael Cohen had a chance to address the court, and he removed any doubt that there is any loyalty between him and Donald Trump, a man he said he once admired, but he says now that there is little to admire. He said that he's been in personal and mental incarceration ever since he took the job with Donald Trump. And he called out the president for saying that he was weak on Twitter. Well, Michael Cohen admitted that he was weak, but he said in court today that 
his own weakness and was a blind loyalty to the man that led him to choose a path of darkness over light. Now, after the court, Michael Cohen was allowed to leave and he will voluntarily submit himself to incarceration in March of next year. But outside the court, another interested observer had something to say, and that was Michael Avenatti. He represents Stormy Daniels, who is one of the women that uh, Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to paying off in order to buy her silence before the 2016 election. Here's what Avenatti had to say. Michael Cohen is neither a hero nor a patriot. He lied for months on end about his criminal conduct and the role of the President of the United States. He lied in March, he lied in April, he lied in May, he lied in June, he lied in July, and only until his back was against the wall and he faced significant prison time did he decide to, quote, come clean. Now, even though he is going to prison for three years, Michael Cohen's role in this drama may not be over because he said that even though he doesn't have a cooperation agreement with the government, he still will offer help to the special counsel's office. At the end, he also told the judge he is truly sorry and that he will try to be a better person. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. The Saskatchewan government is promising to improve safety at the intersection where the Humboldt Broncos crash occurred. 16 people died, 13 others were injured back in April when a bus carrying the junior hockey team collided with a semi-trailer. Olivia Stefanovic reports. The magnitude of loss is still felt here. The report examining the intersection doesn't ease anyone's grief, but it does attempt to prevent more tragedies from happening. Scott Thomas watched the news conference. He lost his 18-year-old son, Evan. To have the government acknowledge that some things can be done to make it safer, um, just kind of put a little feeling of resignation in your heart saying, yeah, you know, it could have been safer. The report does highlight a number of safety concerns, including obstructions to driver's vision. The fixes, a consultant recommends the removal of trees, installation of rumble strips, larger stop and stop ahead signs, wider shoulders and a safe access to the memorial. A recommendation was made to install rumble strips after a family of six was killed in 1997, but the province didn't act. Would rumble strips have helped? I would think rumble strips would have helped. This time, the province is listening, accepting all 13 recommendations from the report at a cost of approximately $1 million. But it requires all drivers to pay attention to what they're doing, follow the rules of the road. Um, and if drivers don't do that, um, we're still going to have accidents. Just Kirat Singh Sadhu, the driver of the semi the Broncos bus collided with, was new to the job and the territory. He's now facing dozens of charges, including dangerous driving causing death. Scott Thomas says there needs to be a federal standard for truck driving training. They're dragging their feet on that. It's only going to make things safer if everybody's trained to a minimum standard from Victoria to Halifax. It's, it's got to be done. Until that happens, families wait for action and answers. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Toronto. The founder and former CEO of Just for Laughs has been charged with sex-related crimes. Gilbert Rozon faces two charges involving a single alleged victim. But several other complainants are disappointed. In their cases, prosecutors say there wasn't enough evidence to lay charges. Steve Rukavina has more. <laughs> the charges date back to 1979. Gilbert Rozon is charged with indecent assault and rape. Those were the criminal code offenses on the books at the time. Police received 14 complaints in total against Rosan. For 13 of those, prosecutors aren't laying charges. They've been meeting with those complainants all week to explain their decision. Some of those complainants, such as Rosan's former sister-in-law, Martine Roy, are struggling to understand. Moi, je trouve ça très, 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 très décevant. Um, et uh, moi, je trouve la justice Québécoise mal. Mes attentes étaient beaucoup plus élevées. The provincial justice minister says prosecutors take these cases very seriously and victims should always come forward. 
I don't want that to discourage them to speak out. It's very important to speak out. It's not a judgment of what happened to them, and, and it's very important for the evolution of the mentality and the society that we don't keep silent. PQ Justice critic Veronique Yvon says that's simply not good enough. When we say, you know, we hear you, we believe you, and you can go to the police authorities, you know, to file a complaint, and we will, you know, the justice system is there for you. Well, I think that today we ask, we have to ask ourselves, is the justice system really there for those types of crimes? Yvonne is asking the government to set up a task force of experts to look at making changes. She says, for example, some countries have set up special sex crime tribunals with different rules. As for Rosan, he'll be in court January 22nd. Steve Rukavina, CBC News, Montreal. Well, fatigue on the flight deck can and does lead to some dangerous close calls and at times disaster. Today, the federal government has moved to improve Canadian flight safety by introducing new restrictions to make sure pilots aren't overbooked and are well rested and alert at work. But it concedes the rules don't address another problem, a growing shortage of pilots. Safety has to be the driving factor here. Uh, we don't want tired pilots flying uh, to get around the problem of uh, pilot shortage. The regulations include new restrictions on alcohol use before duty and capping the number of hours pilots are assigned. Fatigue was a contributing factor in a near disaster in San Francisco last year. The rules apply to both large and small carriers, but airlines have been given two to four years to make the transition. Some exemptions will exist for medevac and emergency services, such as fighting fires. The Air Canada Pilots Association calls the new regulations substandard. A different pilots group calls them a significant improvement. Many Canadians are still being told to avoid romaine lettuce, but up next, we take you inside a high-tech farm that's growing the produce without the fear of E. coli. People in eastern Canada are still being told to avoid romaine lettuce because of an E. coli outbreak. Another one, it's the third in just over 12 months. In all, 77 people have become sick. Part of the problem is that romaine is grown in large open fields where soil and water can be contaminated by runoff from other farms. But there is another way. CBC's Aaron Saltzman takes us inside a high-tech farm that's growing greens without the fear of E. coli. Our, our plants are actually growing up 
in pure water. Urban vertical farming is growing wildly around the world, and in the wake of a series of so far untraceable E. coli outbreaks involving romaine lettuce, proponents say this is a safer alternative. We can track from the seed all the way through the growth cycle. We know the pH level of the nutrient and the water that these plants were grown in essentially every single day of its life. But this indoor farm is also different than others. The key is the lights. Changing the color of the light alters the physiological response of the plant. So using different light combinations, they can manipulate size, shape, texture, and taste. Oh, pepper. Yeah, pepper. Wow. <laughs> way more peppery than, than the arugula I'm used to. What a difference. Light can also be used to change plants' medicinal compounds. It can even make them more nutritious. We can increase things like calcium and phosphorus and various vitamins by as much as 50% just by changing light recipes. This controlled environment was developed at the University of Guelph. The original goal of the research, finding a way to support human life on a mission to Mars. Food determines how far from Earth we can go and how long we can stay. They don't have a mission to Mars yet, but there's no shortage of harsh environments on Earth that could benefit from fresh, local, nutritious vegetables, like the Canadian Arctic or the middle of a desert. Recently, Kuwait set up a large-scale pilot project using this Canadian technology. So far, though, no similar venture here in Canada. It galls me, quite frankly, to think that uh, this Canadian technology, which should be in the north addressing food security issues will find its first expression in a, in a large-scale pilot in the deserts of Kuwait. Perhaps one day Canada too will recognize that the potential for these leafy greens goes well beyond a tasty lunchtime salad. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. The future of farming. Mm. Exactly. A different kind of color show now. Yep. Our nation's capital is celebrating the holiday season with the decades-long tradition of a light show on Parliament Hill. In this time-lapse video, I oh, love it, uh, thousands of colorful lights created a winter wonderland at Centre Block. Yeah, the event's inspired by Canada's nature, climate and culture. It's the 34th edition of the show and it runs every night, if you happen to be in the nation's capital, from 5.30 p.m. to 11 Eastern Time, right through until January 7th. If that doesn't get you in the holiday spirit, I, was I don't say, know yeah. what to ask. Very cool. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, you can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Next local news right here with Dan Burrett at 11 o'clock after the National. Thanks for watching. Good night. Good night.